Good morning. I think the first service did it better, but whatever. Um, welcome to Vista Grande Baptist Church. It's a pleasure to get, be here before you, getting to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together with you. My name is Jonathan Noggle. I am the not quite music intern anymore. Uh, it's officially ended, but since Pastor Jay is out on sabbatical, I am still filling in for a little bit longer. Um, and now we ask that you would turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3, as we prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. My name is Chris Moore. I'm the pastor here at Vista Grande, and I have the opportunity this morning to share with you about a mission trip that I went on. Back in February, I got to go to Peru with Operation Christmas Child and help distribute shoe boxes to the kids there. I got to do this at three different locations, and I got to learn about the ministry, and I got to learn about why this is a great ministry for us to continue partnering with and why we should continue to partner with Operation Christmas Child. First of all, they partner with local churches in the area. So I just sort of had this incorrect idea that a truck pulled up, the kids ran out, they handed out the boxes, and that was it. And that's just not the way it works. Uh, it, it happens through local churches. So local churches have relationships with kids. They usually have a, there's usually a program going on, like Vacation Bible School. And then at the end of that week, at the end of that program, that's when they hand out the boxes. And they know the kids, and they're able to follow up with the kids after they've handed out the boxes. So I just love the fact that this ministry is partnering with and connected with local churches who are on the ground. It's not just people coming in, handing out boxes, and then leaving. A second thing I love about this ministry is they have an emphasis on evangelism, and they have an emphasis on gospel consistency. And here's what I mean by that. The giving of the box is a tool to be able to share the gospel with the kids. And when they give that box, that box comes with a message in it, a gospel message in it that they then take home, and they estimate seven to ten people get to be influenced by that box and by that message. Also, in addition to that, when they hand out the boxes, someone shares the gospel. And I wasn't, I wasn't 100% sure what does that look like, what does that involve, how, how do we know that the, it's an authentic, faithful message that's being shared? And the answer is it is. I got to hear it three different times at three different locations, and each time it was the same message. And you may say, how do you know if they're speaking in Spanish? And the answer is, because I had an interpreter telling me, whispering in my ear what they were saying. And each one, they were making the same points because they had been taught that. There was accountability. There was a, a, a message that they were sticking to. And so there were key elements, our sin, Christ's substitutionary atonement for our sin, our need to put our faith in Him. All the elements that we would consider to be necessary were there. Um, third, their goal is discipleship. Their goal is not hand a box, hand a tract, and we're gone. The goal is they follow up with the kids, and they invite them to then come and start become a part of a discipleship program. Uh, the curriculum that they use is called The Greatest Journey. I think it's a 12-week, 16-week uh, discipleship program. And their goal is to get the kids involved in that. And I got to go witness that and see the discipleship training part of this. And by the way, when they give us numbers on kids who 
who made decisions to trust in Christ, those numbers come from the discipleship. There's an image of the discipleship training right there. The numbers come from the discipleship training program. So over the past 10 years since this program started, there have been 8.9 million decisions for Christ. And those were not just kids raising their hands saying, I want to go to heaven. These are kids who were, had been given a box. They'd been invited to discipleship. They'd been discipled. And then they made a decision for Christ. Finally, uh, I love this ministry because this ministry has a heart for church planting and has a heart for reaching unreached people groups. So the goal is not just keep going back to the exact same places over and over. They don't do that. Instead, they have a heart for let's go to places where we've not gone and let's go to places where the gospel is not. And there are churches that are being planted in areas where the gospel is not present because OCC is going there and delivering shoeboxes and the, and the gospel with that. They're also going into countries where they're actually not supposed to be going for security reasons, uh, countries where it's illegal, but they're taking the gospel there. So I appreciate the heart of this ministry for these reasons I say, let's keep partnering with this ministry. One of the things I love about this ministry is its simplicity. There's a simplicity. All you have to do is get a shoebox and pack it and bring it back here. And that's it. And you can be involved in having a significant impact for Christ if you'll just take a shoebox, go fill it up with some items, and bring it back here, and we'll take care of everything else, getting it to the right places. Um, so, you know, you can be involved in this on an individual level. You can be involved in this on a family level. You can be involved in this as a Sunday school. It's a simple way to be involved in missions, evangelism, outreach. Uh, last year, Vista Grande Baptist Church provided 1,505 boxes. We'd love to do more this year. I'd love to do a lot more than that this year. Uh, uh, there were 103 boxes that were done through Awana, 77 through the Friendship Sunday School class, 20 through Vista Kids Preschool, and 10 through Mops. If you didn't do any shoebox last year, I would encourage you, just do one. Just do one. You say, I don't know how to do that. What do I do? It's simple. On your way out here, you pick up a shoebox. There's tons of them back there. You'll see them wrapped. Pick one up. Take it with you. When you go to the store, buy a few items. There are instructions in the box that tell you the kinds of things to buy and the kinds of things to not buy. You, you fill up the box, and then you bring it back here, and we'll get it going in the right place. So it's very simple. If you didn't do any boxes, do one. If you did one, do two. Let's, uh, let's do quite a few this year. It's a simple way to be involved in a significant ministry for Christ. Thank you very much. If you would, please bow with me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have created. We thank you for your love and grace that you have freely given through your son, Jesus. We thank you for those that have decided to worship with us this morning here at Vista Grande, and we pray that every need present today will be met through the truth that is found in your word. Father, we are reminded and we lift up uh, Emily Skinner with Missions Training International as Emily and staff prepare individuals and families for the many adjustments they will face as they begin ministry in a cross-cultural setting. We are grateful that you have chosen to use Emily in this way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. My name is Gary Rushing, and along with Mike Coover, we are your deacons of the week. Uh, what that means, if you have a prayer need or any practical need that you need some help with something for this upcoming week to let us know. Our phone number is in the back of your order of worship. And uh, if you happen to lose that order of worship during the week, you can call the church office, and I promise you they know how to get hold of Mike and I. Uh, so also, for our visitors, for the first-time visitors and re returning visitors, if you don't mind, we'd love to have a record of your attendance today. There's a tear-off portion in your, uh, uh, your order of worship that you can tear that out and drop it into the offering plate when it passes through later in the service. And at this time, we would like to invite everyone to stand and greet those around you.
now we ask that you would join together with us as we worship in song. Oh uh-huh. 
the mighty rolling sea. Farther than the mountains, farther like a mountain, calls the fishing race for even me. Farther than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus.
I pray. Father God, we thank you. We're grateful, Lord, that we can come and to hear thy word. God, bless the message and bless the messenger. And God, when we speak of your word, may we turn to it daily in our lives and we use it because in there is comfort, and most of all, Lord, it's truth. And God, that's what we seek, is truth, and it's there. May that be embedded in our hearts, Lord, and we would know, and we can be comforted by your word. You'll never leave us. You will never forsake us. And now, God, as we come to this portion of our service, God bless the gift and bless the giver. It may be used only for your work, Lord, spreading thy word all over. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
We are continuing our sermon series in Philippians. Today we're going to talk about experiencing joy through ministry. And some of you may be thinking, well, that's not for me because I'm not a minister. I'm not in ministry. We actually have a conviction at our church that we are all called to be involved in ministry. And in that sense, we are all called to be ministers. It's a term that just simply means servants. We're all called to serve. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 is a key passage that says that Christ gave to the church the offices of pastor, teacher, in order to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So God has given the church certain offices, certain people, pastors, teachers, in order to do what? Do the ministry? Well, in order to equip God's people, the saints, to do the ministry, to do the work of the ministry. So we believe everyone is supposed to be doing the ministry in this sense. That's why our mission statement includes these words, serving and impacting. We believe if you're going to be growing as a disciple, a key part of that is growing as a disciple who not only worships and not only connects, but also who serves, ministers, serves, and who impacts. And so today we're going to talk about experiencing joy through being involved in ministry. So if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Philippians 2. Please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read verses 19 through 30 for us from Philippians 2. And just a reminder, this is the very inspired Word of God. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Let me pray for us. Father, as I look around at this church, Vista Grande, I see many people who are ministering, many people who are serving in many ways. And I pray today as they hear this word, they will just simply be encouraged to keep going, keep serving, keep ministering. And Father, I pray especially for those here this morning who are sort of on the sidelines. I pray they'll hear your word this morning and they will respond by getting involved, by serving, by ministering. And I pray they will experience great joy in that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I want to point out several keys for experiencing joy in the ministry. First, make plans, work hard, and trust God for the outcomes. Look at verse 19. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. So Paul is writing to the church of Philippi, and he says, I'm I'm planning to send Timothy to you. I'm planning to send Timothy to you so that he might minister to you. But notice he says, I hope to do this in the Lord. What does it mean when he says, I hope in the Lord to do this? I think it's his way of saying, I'm trusting God here. I'm making my plans. I'm strategizing, and I'm planning on sending him to you. And I hope I'm able, but I'm hoping in the Lord. In other words, the Lord may have other plans. This might get changed. Things may happen. I think James says it like this in James 4. He says, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. You shouldn't just say, this is what we're going to do, because you don't know for sure that's what you're going to do. God is in control. So you should say, make plans, and then say what you plan to do, but say, Lord willing. We're going to plan to do this in the Lord, if He wills, right? The plans might be changed. You can make the best plans. Sometimes the plans get changed. Paul mentions that the church's plans got changed. The church at Philippi, who sent Epaphroditus to him. Look at verses 27 and 28. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. 
So we get the sense that the church at Philippi sent Epaphroditus to Paul to be with him during his imprisonment in order to encourage him. And we get the sense that the plan was sort of for Epaphroditus to stay there until he was not imprisoned any longer. But guess what? Life happened. Things happened. Epaphroditus got sick, deathly sick, almost died. And it's like Paul saying, look, I don't want this to happen on my watch. I don't want him dying out here for me. I'm going to send him back to you. Plans have changed, right? I, I think we see this. Make plans, work really hard at those plans, but in the end, trust the Lord for the outcomes. If you've ever gone on a mission trip, cross-cultural, you've experienced this. You make plans, and then the plans change. The flight gets canceled. The travel arrangements get messed up. The place where you thought you were going to stay changes. We used to go every summer to Nicaragua. We'd go for a week, and we would go to the same place, and we would train and equip pastors and church leaders who didn't have any access to theological education. And the goal was when we left, they were there trained, equipped, and they kept training the people. And they used to have this term that they would use that we learned very well. They, they called it, they said flexibilidad. In, in English, that's flexibility. You better be flexible. You better be ready to, to change your plans because your plans are going to get changed. I remember one day we showed up, I think it was Monday morning, beginning of the week, and we were there, and what we were doing was teaching and preaching all day long, hot, and right next door, the neighbor decided that particular week he was going to go rent a jackhammer and work on his floor. And so we're speaking and teaching all week long over a jackhammer. That is not much fun, right? What do you, so what do you do? Flexibility. You just go with it, right? God's in control here. You go with it. Um, so this is good for us. Make plans, work hard, but God's in control. Sometimes your plans are going to get changed. That's okay. Trust him even in that. So there's a couple of mentalities that we need to avoid in light of this. One mentality is sort of a fatalistic mentality that sort of says God's in control. He's going to do what he's going to do. So we don't have to do anything. Just let go and let God, right? This is, you know, the same apostle here in chapter 2 verse 12 told us work out your salvation with fear and trembling i have a feeling if he tells us to work out our salvation we probably also ought to work out our plans right there's nothing unbiblical or unspiritual about planning planning is good if you're a bible study teacher a sunday school teacher planning is good some people act like there's something unspiritual about it i guarantee you more people want to come to your class if you plan than if you don't right but some people act like you're really leaning on the spirit if you don't plan at all Planning is good. God gave us planning. He gave us a mind to plan. He gave us wisdom to plan. Planning is good. Our church right now is in the process of planning for next year's budget. All of our church leaders and leadership in key positions, they're, they're, they're budgeting. What, how much do we think we're going to uh, be given? How much is going to be given next year? And, and how much do we need to spend? And how do we prioritize? How do we decide what we're going to fund and what we're not going to fund? We're in the middle of that right now. It involves a lot of work. It involves a lot of talking. It involves a lot of thinking and planning and praying. And it's good. It's a good process. It's good for us to ask these questions. What do we plan to spend the money on? I think some people would say, let's just sort of let go and let God and just let the Spirit lead. And there's something very biblical, very spiritual, very wise about planning and sticking to the plan. But also recognizing there needs to be some flexibility, right? Some flexibility. God's, God will work out the outcomes. A second mentality that we have to avoid is this mentality that says, look, we can't plan for every possible contingency. We can't plan for every possible risk. So therefore, let's just do nothing. Some people are ultra conservative in this way. It's like, oh no, we better not do that because this might happen. Well, yeah, it might, right? But, but we're not supposed to be frozen and do nothing just because there's some potential contingency that might happen that we can't foresee. Of course, there's some potential contingency that might happen that we can't foresee. That's the nature of the world we live in. That doesn't shut us down. That doesn't freeze us up. We, we, we trust in the Lord. We, we make good plans. We make wise plans. We make calculated plans. We count the cost and then we press on. And if something happens that we can't foresee, we trust the Lord and we deal with it when that happens, right? So it's healthy. It's healthy to do a certain risk assessment, risk analysis. It's good to be aware of those kinds of things. It's good to be wise in that way, but it's also good to, after you've made your decision, to say, we're going to trust in the Lord and press on here, All right? So I really want to just drive this home and make this practical for you, 
right? So I think I'm afraid that some of us think we have to have all of our ducks in a row before we can do anything. Before I can do ministry, I need to get all my ducks in a row. And I just want to encourage you, it doesn't have to be that way, right? Some of you, you may feel a certain conviction that you ought to be sharing the gospel with a certain person, but you're waiting for the stars to align to do it. You're just waiting for the perfect opportunity. You're waiting for that person to ask the perfect question and sort of tee you up. And you're just waiting till you can do all your research and have all the potential questions that they may ask. How are you going to answer them? And at some level, you just got to go for it. At some level, it's always going to be awkward sharing the gospel. But yes, it's going to be awkward. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be completely free of awkwardness. At some level, you just pray, look for an opportunity. And when the opportunity comes, you go for it. You don't wait till all the ducks are in a row and all the stars align to do it. Right? Another example, some of you may be waiting until a certain moment in your life or time in your life to serve. So you feel like you ought to be serving and you know you should be serving, but you have this mentality, I'm too busy right now. I have too much going on. So I'm going to wait till a season of my life when I'm not so busy. It's never going to come, right? You, you, there's never going to be a season where you're not busy, right? And I think there's wisdom in not over committing ourselves. I'm not suggesting here you take on a million commitments. But I am suggesting here, if you're not committed in any way, serving in any way the Lord, I don't care how busy you are, you ought to take on a commitment and say, I'm going to serve. Maybe it's a small commitment. Maybe it's a minimal commitment. But you wait till your ducks are in a row before you do something, you're going to wait for the rest of your life. Don't sit around waiting the rest of your life. Go for it. Get involved. Make a commitment. And then after you've served that commitment, maybe it's a semester, maybe it's a year, come back and reevaluate. Is this the ministry for me? Do I need to keep going? Do I need to try something else? And if you do make a commitment to a ministry, get ready to be flexible. Get ready for flexibility. You volunteer in the kids' ministry, it's not going to be exactly like what you thought. You volunteer to lead a Bible study, it's not going to be exactly like what you thought. You volunteer and willingly serve on a certain committee in the church, things are going to happen. You got to be flexible. You need a little flexibility. We have a, a lady who's leading a Bible study on Fridays and she was telling me that this, this past Friday, she was really planning and hoping for a few unbelievers to be there. And she was really looking forward to sharing the gospel. And she asked us to pray, and we prayed. And I asked her Friday evening, I emailed her, how did it go? And she said, well, they ended up not coming. But she said, we focused on the ones who were there, and we really talked about assurance of salvation. What is that? It's flexibility. Done. Made plans. Unfortunately, the plans didn't happen. That's okay. They were good plans. Just didn't work out exactly the way it was planned, but that's okay. He was flexible and focused on uh, assurance of salvation, which she thought that the folks in the study needed to hear. So here's the point. You want to experience joy in ministry? If you're going to be involved in ministry, it involves work. It involves planning. It also involves trusting the Lord for the outcomes and being flexible in that. Second, develop meaningful partnerships in ministry. One of the keys for experiencing joy in ministry is to not do it by yourself. Don't be a lone ranger. Partner together with God's people and experience joy in those key relationships in ministry. We see a key relationship between Paul and the church at Philippi. In verse 19, he says, I'm planning to send Timothy to you. Even though Timothy was extremely valuable to Paul, Paul valued that relationship. In fact, he says, I'm going to wait and see how things go with me before I send him to you. That's how valuable he was. And yet Paul says, I'm going to send him to you. The person-on-person -person contact was important. It wasn't enough just to write a letter. I'm sending Timothy to you so you can be with him and he can be with you and he can minister to you. There's something about the person-on-person, face-to-face -person, uh, -face conversation that's important in ministry. Paul says, I'm planning on coming and visiting you. So think about this. Paul doesn't say, well, I got more churches to plant. I've already planted you. I'm done with you. I'm moving on. No. There's a relationship there. The relationship is key. He says, I'm planning to visit you. Paul emphasizes his relationship with Timothy in verse 22. He says, you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. They've developed this deep bond like a father and a son, and Paul values Timothy. He, there's a sense in which he needs Timothy. He says, I'm not going to send Timothy to you until I figure out what happens with me. Why? Why? Because I need him like a, a son in the faith. I need him. There's a, there's, a, a, there's a need. There's a relationship. It's not just Lone Ranger. I can do this without people. I need Timothy here. And notice the way that Paul talks about Epaphroditus and his relationship with Epaphroditus. Look at verse 25. Look at some of these key words he uses. 
I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Epaphroditus is a person that the church of Philippi had sent to Paul to be with him there while he was in prison. And Paul's sending him back. And Paul refers to him, first of all, as my brother. They are brothers. They're not biological brothers, but they're brothers in the faith. They've both been adopted as God's sons, and therefore they are brothers. And he doesn't just call him, this isn't just sort of a theoretical, he's a brother. He says, he's my brother. I'm sending my brother to you. And my question for you is this. Do you have someone in the ministry that you can say, this is my brother, right? You have a lot of brothers and sisters in here. I'm talking about, do you have someone you say, this is my brother, this is my sister, right? We've partnered together in ministry. If you don't have that, that might be the reason why you're not experiencing the joy you want to experience. There's a joy that comes with having someone you partner with in ministry that you can say, this is my brother. Notice Paul also calls him a fellow worker. Paul doesn't pull rank and say, well, I'm the apostle here. I'm clearly the one that's important here. I mean, I'm the apostle. I look at the, I'm writing these letters that are probably going to one day be in the New Testament, right? I'm, uh, I'm planning churches. And here's little Epaphroditus over here. He's my sidekick. I'm sending him back to you. He doesn't do that. He honors him. You know, a guy that we know very little about. And here's Paul, the apostle, calling him a fellow worker. What's he doing? He's dignifying him. He's honoring him. He's my fellow worker. Welcome him back. You know, I want to encourage you, those of you who are serving in ministry, look around at the people you're serving with. And some of them may be less experienced than you. Some of them may be younger than you. Some of them may be less gifted than you. Look at that as an opportunity to bring them along. This is my fellow worker in the gospel. We're in this together. There's dignify them, honor them in that. I remember when some guys did that with me when I was young and young in the faith and you know, they brought me along and they encouraged me and they, they valued me and that meant a lot. It went a long way for me. In some ways I am here today because of them. They brought me along in the ministry. They, they considered me a fellow worker when I probably wasn't pulling my weight. Right? And so I, I just say, ask you, who, who, are you, who are you doing that with? Who are you bringing along in the faith? And this is my fellow worker in the gospel. There's joy in it. Notice he calls him a fellow soldier. He's my fellow soldier. We're in warfare together. We're at war. Ministry is warfare. That's not to say there's not fun elements to it. It's not to say there's not enjoyable elements to it. There's joy in it. But ministry, true ministry, is warfare. There's a battle taking place when we do ministry. It's an unconventional battle, and it has unconventional weapons, but it's a battle nonetheless. And there, there's a war you know, when you're teaching five-year-old Sunday school class, that's spiritual warfare. <laughs> and the Sunday school teacher said, amen. <laughs> it doesn't look like it. You know, from the outside looking in, it just kind of looks like animal crackers and juice and watercolors and crayons. It just looks like five-year-old Sunday school. But we know this is warfare, right? This is the gospel advancing. This is uh, uh, loving children and sharing the gospel with children and opening up the word to children. I mean, this is warfare. This is the gospel advancing, right? My fellow soldier in the ministry. Many of you, some of you have experienced literal war. You, you've literally been in the trenches fighting a literal war. And I get the sense that those of you who have the people you have fought with, there's a bond that you develop with them that, that runs deep. You've been in the trenches with them. You've risked your life with them. I'm guessing there is a bond that runs deep there that the rest of us probably don't really understand. But in a similar kind of way, we ought to have those kinds of bonds among each other. We've, we've served in the trenches together. We've done ministry together. We've been to war together. And therefore, there's something that runs deep there. There's joy to be found there. And my question is, is have you experienced that at all? Is there anyone you could point to and say, we've been in the trenches together? And I would encourage you, if there is, maybe call them up or email them and let them know, hey, I'm grateful for you and that time we spent together in the trenches. Thank you, that means a lot to me. And some of you may be there right now. You may be in the trenches right now and some of you may be tempted to get out. Let's just get out of this. Why are we doing this? Why am I putting myself at risk here? I want to encourage you. Press on and build, forge those relationships with the others and find joy in that. There's joy to be found 
in that. Notice that Paul refers to him as a messenger and a minister. He's a messenger because he's sent from the church to Paul with a message. And he's a minister because he's there to minister to Paul. He's there to serve Paul. So he's a minister. Notice, once again, relationships are key to experiencing joy in the ministry. If you do it alone, you won't experience the joy that you will experience if you partner together. And I don't know about you, but I can see it. I can look back at our church and I can see people who are partnered together doing ministry together and I can see the joy that exists among them. There are certain Sunday school teachers, they teach together and you just see a partnership there. That You're almost jealous of it. I want to be involved with that. I've noticed the people who partner together and do OCC, Operation Christmas Child Boxes, they've done it for many years now. And you just hang around them a little bit and it's infectious. They, they like each other. They're served with each other. They've done it for many years. They know what they're doing. And there's a part of you that almost gets jealous. I want to be involved in that. I want to be a part of that group. You know, I want to be in the midst of that, serving in the trenches together. There's joy there. I noticed there's a group of guys and, they, and ladies, and they, they, they work on a turkey Thanksgiving basket meals for, for the Springs Rescue Mission. We'll be hearing about that pretty soon, I'm sure. But if you watch them, they enjoy it, and they interact, and they've been serving together for years doing this. And so my question is, is there an area in your life that you could point to and say, here's my group, here's my people, Here, we're, we're serving together. Here's what we're doing, here's the joy we're having. Is anybody looking at you going, man, I kind of want to be involved in that. And if there's not, that might explain why you're not experiencing the joy that deep down you're wanting to experience. It, we would love to see all of our Sunday school classes look like this. This is sort of the vision, it's sort of the goal. We would love to be able to look at every single one of our Sunday school classes and see a group of people not just studying God's Word together, though that's very important, and not just fellowshipping together, though that's very important. We would love to see a group of people connected together, partnering together, serving, serving together, serving God's people together, serving each other, and impacting together in a way where there's joy in it. If if every single one of our classes visitors came and visited and they saw those classes and they just said, wow, which one do I join? They're all, they're all seem to be, just have this brotherhood, this, this fellowship of, of just serving together and impacting together. That's the vision. That's what it looks like for us to grow in Christ through worshiping, connecting, serving, and impacting. So if you're sitting there and you're saying, I, I'm interested and I like what you're saying, but what's the next step? Here's the next step. Go get involved in a Sunday school. And if you're already involved in a Sunday school, take the next step there and start getting involved. Start serving. You be the catalyst in the Sunday school to get it going, to serving each other and impacting the community. And and by the way, this isn't the thing that that happens overnight. So don't go visit a Sunday school class on Sunday and go, well, I went and it didn't happen. I didn't experience any joy in it, right? This is a long process. Stay committed. Keep serving. Keep going. Keep working at it. And then start to experience it the joy in it. There's joy to be found. But but one of the keys is partnering together with God's people. Third, serve for the joy of others. Look again at chapter 2, verse 19. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. He says, I'm sending Timothy to you to encourage you for your joy so that it might cheer me on. For Paul, his joy is connected to the church's joy. If their joy increases, his joy increases. Can you say that? Can you say that your joy is connected to the joy of God's people so that if God's people's joy is increased, your joy is increased? That's what he's talking about here. And he also mentions that Timothy is like this. Look at verses 20 and 21. I have no one like him, referring to Timothy, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, but you know Timothy's proven worth. Paul says, I've got no one like him. Why, Paul? What do you mean you have no one like him? Because he's so gifted? Because he's such a great speaker? Because he's such a great evangelist? What do you mean you have no one like him? I mean, I've got no one like him because he's so genuinely concerned for the welfare of others. He's not concerned for his own welfare. He's concerned for the welfare of others. I've got no one like him. Verse 21 says, he says, they all seek their own interests. Who's he referring to there? They all seek their own interests. The answer is, I don't know. I don't know who he's got in mind. 
Maybe he's got in mind the same people he talks about in chapter 1, verse 15, when he talks about these people who preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. The truth is, our natural instinct is to serve self. Look out for your own self, look out for your own joy, pursue your own joy. But the irony is, if you pursue your own joy, you won't experience it. But if you pursue the joy of others, then you'll experience the true joy. Jesus also warned about people, like Paul is warning about here. People, the King James calls them hirelings. Here's the way Jesus says it in John 10. He says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So Jesus' warning is here. Watch out for the hirelings. Watch out for the hired hands. That is the people who are in leadership positions, but they're there mainly for the paycheck or they're there mainly for the title. Or they're there mainly for the dignity that comes with the position, right? Watch out for the person who's serving for their own sake, Jesus says. By the way, I'd say, you know, the person on TV asking for money might be a person that he's talking about here, right? Watch out for the person who's serving for their own interests, their own sake. And I think there's also a warning here to us. Don't be that person. Because these people exist. Jesus warned about them. Paul warned about them. They're present today. These people exist. People who serve mainly for their own sake and not for God's people's sake. And I think there's a warning here. You make sure you're not this person who's serving for your own primary benefit, who's serving for your own primary accolades or respect or dignity or title or paycheck or whatever. Say, how do I know if that's me or not? Here's one way you know. Do you, do you leave when the going gets tough? Say, I'll serve as long as it's easy. See, if you serve as long as it's easy, what you're saying is I'm serving for my own sake. But if you say I'm serving for the joy of others, then I'll stay even when it's tough. So if you're quick to give up when the going gets tough, it reveals where your heart is. It reveals why you're really serving. You're not serving for God's people. You're serving because you want an easy role to serve in, to say I'm serving. Don't be the kind of person that when it doesn't go your way, you pick up your ball and go home. That's the person who says, I'll serve as long as I get my way. But if I don't get my way, I'm out of here. I'm taking my ball and I'm leaving. What are you saying? I'm not interested in serving God's people. I'm interested in serving as long as I get to have my way. It's about me. It's 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 a heart change here. We see that Paul is concerned for the sake of the church, not his own sake. Timothy is concerned for the sake of the church. Epaphroditus is concerned for the sake of the church. Epaphroditus says, I need to go back and be with them because they're concerned for me because I almost died. And Paul says, okay, I'll send you back. He's concerned for the church. And Paul's concerned for Epaphroditus. He writes in here, hey, church, when he comes back, honor him. I know it may seem like he's leaving the assignment early because it's not fulfilling the plan you had, but honor him when he comes back because he risked his life for me. Why is Paul doing that? Why are you putting your neck on the line for Epaphroditus? Because he lives for the joy of others. He lives for the honor of others. He's looking out for him. I was talking with someone from our church recently, and I was thanking them for serving. I noticed they serve very sacrificially. I noticed in some ways it's not really benefiting them. It's not like they have a child in the ministry, and they're they're, they're serving in a way that's benefiting their family. So I just said, thank you for serving. You're serving in a way that doesn't even benefit you directly. And they were quick to correct me. Oh, it does benefit me. They said, I get to serve and it's a blessing to me. I said, right on. Right? This is how the gospel works. It's kind of counterintuitive. If you, if you serve for your, primarily for your own sake and for your own joy and for your own causes and your own purposes, you probably won't experience a lot of joy in it. But if you serve for the sake of others, if you live for the sake of others, there's joy to be found in that. That's just the way God wired us. It's a, it's a gospel principle. Look out for the needs of others, and you'll find joy in that. And by the way, that doesn't just apply to the church and ministry. That applies in every area of life. That applies in your home. That applies in your marriage. Are you struggling in your marriage? Having a hard time finding joy in your marriage? How about stop worrying so much about your joy and your happiness and what you're getting out of it and start focusing more on her? And what does she need? And how can I be here for her? And how can I serve her? And see if you don't start to experience a little more joy in a marriage. 
or with your children, struggling with children, how about start asking the question, what can I do to serve them instead of how can they make my life easier? Or your friendships. Say, why don't I have these friendships that are lasting and bring me happiness and joy the way I kind of long to have them? Maybe because in your friendships, it's more about what you're getting out of them. It's more about you. And you're more concerned about how your friends aren't being good friends to you. Maybe you should be more concerned about how can you bless them, be a joy to them. Try it. Test it. And see if you don't experience joy in living for the joy of others. This is how we experience joy in the ministry. Now let's ask this tough question. How do we get motivated to do this? Because in verse 21, Paul says, they all seek their own interests. I don't know exactly who he has in mind, but I know that's a pretty universal term. They all. We all have this instinct to take care of our own interests and our own sakes and our own joy. So how do I get motivated? If I'm really honest, if I really am not motivated to serve for your joy, how do I get motivated and get to a place where I'm ready to get up and serve for your joy? And the answer is, you don't, you don't get up and go do anything. You sit there and you, and, and you think about and consider the fact that Jesus did this for you. He came and served you. He came and gave everything for you. He came and got down on his hands and knees for your sake, for your joy. And you just sit there and consider that and ponder that until it melts your heart and it changes it and you can't help but get up and go serve someone else because you realize that you've been served. Listen to, what, listen to how Jesus contrasts himself with the hirelings that he mentions in John 10. He says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Think about this. Jesus came for your good. He came for your joy. He came for your life. You and I deserve death. We deserve death because we've sinned. We deserve death because we have an instinct, an impulse towards selfishness. We have a tendency to look out for myself and not others. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus came in order to take the punishment for us, in order to die for us so we might live. Even though he was God, even though he was God, he didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross for your joy, for your good, for your life, for you. You can experience that today. That can be yours today. But Jesus, you have to let him serve you. You have to go to him and trust in what he's done for you through his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And if you will, if you'll simply go to him and let him serve you, you can have everything you need met, all your needs met in Christ. Forgiveness of sin, adoption of sons and daughters, hope of eternal life. You can all be yours if you'll just go to Christ and trust him. What's keeping you today from just going to Christ and trusting him for that, letting him serve you? Even though he was God, your creator, he came to serve you. Why are you not letting him serve you? Go to him and trust him for that. Make sure you've done that. Don't leave here today until you've done that. And if you say, I already have, I'm trusting in Christ. Wonderful. Go to him again and sit there until it gets inside of you that the king of kings, God himself, came and humbled himself to serve you. He came as a minister for your needs. He came to minister to you. He became a servant for you. Don't move from there until it changes you, until it melts you, and you say, how can I not get up and turn around and go serve him and go serve his people? I can't help but do it because he served me. And then you'll experience joy. You'll search, you'll seek for the joy of others. And in that, by God's grace and his design, you'll experience true joy. Let me pray for us. Father, we are grateful and we are humbled this morning that we get to be a part of your work, your ministry. We recognize that the only way, we're not qualified for this. There's nothing about us that qualifies us for this. We are completely, utterly disqualified in and of ourselves. But you sent your son to be our minister, to serve us, and he served us in the most ultimate way through his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And I pray every single individual here this morning will go to him and trust him for that and be served by him in that way. 
so that we might become your children your sons and your daughters. And Father, I pray that we won't leave there, but we'll stay there and consider the sacrifice and consider how we've been served and consider how we don't deserve it. And I pray that will just compel us. It'll motivate us. It'll move our hearts and our minds to a point where we can't help but get up and go and serve for the name of Christ and the sake of Christ and the kingdom and to serve your people. Father, I pray we will develop deep partnerships here at Vista Grande, serving your church, serving your people, serving this community, and I pray we will experience a supernatural, inordinate amount of joy in that. We pray this in the strong name of your son, Jesus. Amen. At this time, we're going to respond.